Welcome, everyone, to the Wednesday, April 20th, 2022, formal meeting of the Iowa City Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, in attendance are Commissioners Martin, Townsend, Hench, Nolte, Signs, and Craig. I, is Commissioner Padron? I, have heard heard, her? I haven't heard from her since earlier today. I'm not sure. Very good. Well, if she comes in, we'll make sure we <coughs> note that for the uh, minute taker. Uh, for first, second, third item on the agenda. I could count is public discu discussion um, Maria is here hi Maria Hello. Um, item number three public discussion of any item not on the agenda this is the opportunity for any member of the public to address the Commission on any item not on the agenda is there anyone who'd like to address the Commission seeing no one coming forward we'll go on to the next item <clears throat> This is item under zoning code text amendments. This is item number four, case number REZ22-0002. This is consideration of an amendment to Title 14, zoning to allow basic utility uses in the neighborhood public P1 zone. <coughs> Kirk. Thank you. So what we're looking at tonight, like you said, uh, pretty clearly to allow private basic utility uses in the P1 zone. Uh, there are some other changes that are part of this amendment as well. So you'll notice some changes to just the way that the public zone section is set up. Uh, right now it's a little different than other zone sections, so we want to try and make it as similar as the others as possible to make it easier for, for legibility for the public and staff. Uh, and then it also does include some modified criteria for basic utility uses. So all of those are kind of roped in, but, but really what kicked this off was, was the desire to uh, allow private basic utilities uh, in P1 zones. So just as some background, the public zones historically has been used to denote public ownership of land. Um, so P1 specifically is, is the local ownership of land. So that's county, that's the school district, um, that's the city. Any, any of those would be zoned P1. Uh, and some private uses are already allowed either provisionally or by special exception in public zones. Um, but it has, like I said, historically been used to denote ownership. So we're trying to move away from that a little bit with this amendment, since there are some private uses already allowed, and then also looking at private basic utility uses. Uh, in terms of basic utility uses, so those are public or private infrastructure services. Uh, they have to be near the, the area where the service is being provided. Um, so you might think of things like electronic or electric substations. You might think of uh, communication switching and relay facilities, water and sewer lift stations, water towers, reservoirs, that sort of thing. Um, but it could be public or privately owned. So it, it's a mix of the two. Um, they are allowed in public zones currently only if they were publicly owned. Um, and then they are also allowed in commercial zones, most commercial zones at least, uh, not the mixed use zone. Then they're allowed in industrial research, riverfront crossing zones, and then the T4 uh, form-based zones, in addition to some non-residential interim development zones as well. So it is allowed in a variety of zones, uh, but we're hoping to expand that a little bit for reasons I'll get into tonight. And this is something that staff has discussed for the past several years. You know, it's, it's come up and then usually an alternative site is found and so we drop it and then it comes up and then it's dropped. And usually it's in uh, discussions with, uh, most recently I'm on in Mid-American Energy as they're looking for substations in growing areas and I'm on as they're looking to expand services uh, within their territory in existing neighborhoods. Um, so Iowa City is growing, it needs these services and services are changing over time. So it can be challenging to, to place these services in areas for necessary infrastructure. So in terms of the approval criteria that apply to basic utility uses, um, in some cases, uh, it's provisionally allowed uh, in commercial, uh, interim development, commercial, uh, research development, uh, research zones, RFC zones, and then the T4 form-based zones. It's allowed provisionally if it's enclosed within a use and it has to contain another use that is allowed in the zone. Uh, another use that is allowed provisionally are water and sanitary sewer pump stations uh, that are approved as part of site plan or as subdivision review. So the idea being that it has another review that, that allows it provisionally uh, or if it's within a building with another use. Now, there are some kind of odd uh, caveats with that. So if it's a standalone utility use enclosed within a building, it triggers the special exception because it doesn't have another use allowed in the zone. Uh, and for T4 zones, that does have to be enclosed. There's no special exception option. 
Now, within those zones, if it doesn't meet those provisional criteria, then it has to go through a special exception, which was reviewed by the Board of Adjustment. Uh, and some of the approval criteria for that are that it has to be screened from public view in view of ad adjacent residential zones to the S3 standard. Uh, and then it has to be compatible with, with surrounding structures and uses based on safety, size, height, scale, location, and design. And then there's also general approval criteria that uh, apply to any special exception. Um, a lot of those are, are relatively general, you know, won't hurt neighboring properties, impact property values, uh, adequate utilities, uh, abides by the comprehensive plan, all those sorts of general criteria that apply to uh, special exceptions apply here. There's also some ability for the Board of Adjustment to modify some standards uh, that doesn't really apply to, to what we're talking about today. Now, they're also allowed in industrial zones and interim industrial zones, and those requirements uh, it's provisionally allowed if it's 200 feet from any residential zone and screened from a uh, view of public right of way to the S3 standard. So it's, it's a lesser, lesser standard than what you see in the other zones. Um, but if it is within 200 feet, it still can apply for a special exception within those zones um, and just has to meet those standards that I mentioned for special exceptions. So what the proposed amendment looks to do is to treat private basic utility uses in public zones as if it was in a commercial zone. So uh, it would be, you know, all those criteria that I said before, if it's enclosed, then it would be allowed provisionally. If it's not enclosed, essentially, then it would be subject to a special exception. Uh, one of the other changes that we are recommending with this is to strike the standard uh, that enclosed utilities uh, require another allowed use within the building. Um, what this would allow is administrative review of standalone enclosed utilities. Uh, and one of the reasons that we're bringing this up is because a lot of our requests for enclosed utilities are, um, are communications hubs. We've recently seen them with, I we've seen two in the last year with IMON, or in the last five years, excuse me, two in the last five years with IMON. And I'm realizing you can't probably read the screen, so I'm going to dim that yeah. quick. This is what a IMON utility uh, communications hub looks like. Uh, it's something that doesn't have another use in it and applying special exception criteria to an enclosed building is a little strange and so we just recommend striking that criteria relying instead on our existing site development standards that we have in place um, just to prevent that additional uh, administrative or excuse me board of adjustment review rather than just administrative review. And then finally like I said some changes to the public zone section generally such as adding in a use table um, and then modifying language regarding the purpose and regarding public ownership uh, with the goal of trying to get it more uh, similar to other zones where it's, the zones are based on the use, not based on ownership. So in terms of analysis for, for this proposed amendment, uh, what we see currently is that um, areas that allow basic utility uses generally are located, you know, in commercial and industrial areas. So you're looking near downtown, you're looking along major corridors like the highways and interstate, uh, you're looking near railroads and you're looking in those defined commercial nodes, things like Towncrest, uh, Old Town Village, Walden Square. Um, so they do exist in quite a few areas in the city, uh, but there are some notable gaps, especially in developing areas. So especially to the south, the southwest and to the east where we're seeing more recent development. Uh, so that can become an issue when trying to uh, locate utilities for those growing areas. And then also in some residential areas, they still are far from those neighborhood commercial nodes. You're far from those commercial areas. And so that can make it hard for you know, the expansion of IMON, for example, or any future uh, network provider that wants to come into the community. Um, however, public zones are better dispersed throughout the community. Um, you know, you see fire stations all over the place in growing areas. You see possibility of schools. Of course, that would be... Uh, that would require some discussion. You see parks, you see all sorts of public uses all over. So there's a map that's included in your packet. Um, what it really shows is if you look at the red and the purple, it's relatively concentrated into what, where those uses are allowed. Uh, and again, you can see those gaps in growing areas. But if you look at that bluish where the P1 zones are located, they're better dispersed throughout the city. And so that will really allow us to meet some of these areas where there might be gaps. Uh, and there's some other benefits as well that I'll get to in a second. Um, in addition, we looked at some other, the other comparable large communities in Iowa. So we're looking at Des Moines, Cedar Rapids, and Davenport, the other largest communities. Um, they do allow private basic utility uses in a wider variety of zones, 
Uh, they often allow it in residential zones, which, which was a surprise to me. Um, and they differentiate between major and minor utilities. So it's similar to the way that we look at enclosed versus unenclosed, but they, they view that a little differently. Uh, and I do have a summary of, of those comparisons within your packet. Um, generally what you see is that it, it, in Des Moines, substations are considered major. That does require Board of Adjustment approval. But in Cedar Rapids, they're considered minor, and so it, it's provisional approval. Uh, but generally, you know, the, the higher impact the basic utility use has, the more standards you see, you often bring in a Board of Adjustment review. Uh, and generally, uh, they're allowed in pretty much all zones, either as a permitted use or as a conditional approval. Uh, in some cases, such as Davenport, uh, they're pretty much allowed uh, as is, as long as they're in a, an easement or uh, within the right of way. So all private utilities are also considered public utilities, which surprised me a little bit. Um, but these other communities do avoid some of the issues that we see, uh, but we think that with the proposed amendment, we can address some of these gaps that we're seeing and, and hopefully have uh, less substantive changes that might be required to, to be more like comparable communities. Uh, so in general, this allows you know a, a broader area where these utilities can be placed, um, and that includes around public uses that might be suitable, so near lift stations or other city or county owned properties. Uh, and because they're treated similarly to other basic utility uses in commercial zones and um, kind of that step up from residential that we typically see, uh, we don't anticipate any substantial issues with the proposed changes. Uh, and this also prevents a risk that we run if we require rezoning to commercial designations uh, in developing areas where you might either commercial or, or higher intensity uh, zones, uh, where if that utility use leaves in the future, you're left with this zone that could be redeveloped as something that might not be as compatible uh, with surrounding uses. So we think that there's some ability to use public zones uh, instead of that, where you can have a bit more control over, over what uses uh, might be there once a use leaves, once a utility use leaves. In terms of consistency with a comprehensive plan, uh, there are growth and infrastructure policies that are included in the plan. Uh, typically, they're not focused so much on where utilities should be placed, uh, but it's focused more on how we should have growth in existing areas or areas that will be best served uh, by existing and proposed infrastructure um, that provides high levels of service with efficient costs. So there are several strategies throughout the plan that talk about this, such as identifying uh, opportunities for infill development and concentrating new development in areas contiguous uh, to existing development. So they don't directly address infrastructure, but it kind of gives you that, uh, the, the mindset about how well planned utilities are essential and ensuring that it's cost effective. Uh, and so providing basic utility uses in P1 zones does have a couple benefits. Uh, it allows improved coordination between public and private utilities, uh, and then also provides greater flexibility in placing those to ensure uh, cost effective services. So we also did receive some public comment uh, as part of this. I believe that's been forwarded to you. You should have it at, at your uh, desks up there. Uh, Mid-American Energy submitted uh, the, some revised language that they recommend. Um, one is to explicitly state that private ownership is allowed in P1 zones for basic utility uses, and the other is to change will to may in describing what uh, designates uh, a P1 zone, whether you have to be a P1 zone if you're these uses or whether you may be the use. Uh, staff does support that change. Uh, staff generally doesn't think that explicitly stating private utility uses is, is necessary um, at this time. Uh, and so based on these findings, based on this review, staff does recommend that the zoning code uh, be amended to allow basic utility uses in neighborhood public P1 zones, provisionally or by special exception as illustrated in attachment one of the staff report. Uh, and that concludes my presentation. So if you have any questions, feel free to let me know. Thank you, Kirk. Now's the opportunity for the commission to ask um, questions of staff. Um, I have a couple for you, Kirk. Um, <clears throat> previously, it was the term was only if publicly owned as far as utilities, and that's going to transition to all basic utilities. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. So will this be a... a, a Will we replace the purchase of easements by utilities? So could they just go to a public area rather than have to negotiate with a private property owner to purchase an easement at market rate? Um, I believe that they could, or? I, I don't know that it will affect that. Yeah. Um. What, what they'll be able to do is if we have 
an existing public facility that would be appropriate for for a basic utility use next to it, we could actually allow them to to build their basic utility use on that public land, <coughs> or you know, portion off a part of it, subdivide it, or whatever, so that they could purchase that. So a privately held utility or an investor held utility could place their property on public land at no cost to that utility. Is no, that correct? No, that's Did not what this is doing. This would allow them to purchase land. So they would have to, to build, purchase it. Say a substation. Okay. And how is that price determined? Would it just be through? Open market. Okay. I mean, I'm, they would negotiate so the that. the property have to, would it have to be assessed just like anything else? You, yeah, I mean, it doesn't appraised? Be, appraised, I mean. Okay. Well, it would just depend on their negotiations, their private negotiations. Okay. And then since this is uh, approval is provisional, and is that at, done then at, if I understand correct, at an administrative level, and sometimes they go to Board of Adjustment depending? Is that correct? So if it is enclosed within a building, it would be provisional, where it would be administratively reviewed. Um, if it is not enclosed, you know, you think electric substation, then that would be Board of Adjustment reviewed. Okay. All right. And so just to give you an idea, another idea about, um, you know, as you're talking about placing a use with, with another use allowed in the zone, uh, in the past, this this was before my time, but in the past, there there have been utilities that have said, well, we'll build a warehouse that's also there, which is a use allowed in the zone, and then we'll just attach our use to it, and then it's provisionally allowed rather than going to the Board of Adjustment. So we're trying to to circumvent some of those the odd quirks that come with our code in terms of that revision to the provisional use standards. Yeah. Is there um, a maximum size? So... Um, you know, if they're on public land, is there a, a maximum uh, size that they can build on, or does it have to be a percentage of the the overall land that they're looking at, or what does that look like? So they'd be subject to standards that anyone building on public land would require. So there are some site development standards. It's less strict on public land than other places or than other zones, um, but there's no size requirement involved as currently proposed. Is this one of my major questions is I don't understand the minor major, which in the in some of the other cities they talk about. And and I kept thinking of easements and, you know, all the green boxes, which I think of as transformers, if that's correct, mm -hmm. um, or, you know, the gas things that stick out of what I think of as the easement of the public right of way. But many of those are in people's yards or, I mean, how'd they get there if? So. There's easements for them. I mean, that'd be a utility easement. So and if they're in at someone's yard, there is a utility easement at some point. It was established. Right. Th there is, but we also have a distinction where we have mechanical equipment versus utility uses. Mechanical equipment, I think, is a lot of the stuff that you're thinking of, which is kind of that smaller stuff needed in the day-to-day, -day. like, you know, you, you can have power lines. <laughs> That's not restricted. What this is talking about is, you know, those larger utility uses, pump stations, you know, gas, regu gas relay stations, electric substations, communications hubs. Okay. Some of those. So are. this really does not deal with any of those things that are in easements. To, or in, you know that you think of the, you know, the, some of them can be as big yeah. as this desk a green box but those smaller things are not part of this no okay those and would be they, allowed regardless huh those would be allowed regardless excuse me okay okay can you go back one slide <clears throat> susan did you still have another question that's okay you oh sorry yours. Susan. my another is on something entirely different okay. so go for it uh can you just walk us through what the staff's thinking here on on why you you don't think this is necessary or do you want to take that or do you want me to yeah by definition a basic utility use is public or private utility so um you know typically we don't zone based on who owns the land it's based on how the land is used and that's what we're trying to do here is is get back to that uh and so that's why we feel like it's pretty clear already that um, 
it can be public or private utility uses yeah. in its own. Sorry. But actually, that was my question. I don't. It seems to me you're referring to the land here, not to what is going to put, be put on the land in that amendment. But the purpose of the public zones is to provide reference to public ownership and use of land. Right, and then the next or to private ownership is the proposed that, change. That's that's the use of land for basic utility. I, that's the mid America. The mid American one is is with red and blue. That's on right. your desk. Yeah. Uh, our proposed staff's proposed one was just the red. So staff's proposed language is the proposed purpose of the public zone is to provide reference to public ownership and use of land or to the use of land for infrastructure services that need to be located in or near the area where the service is provided. Right. I thought you said you supported the change that Mid-America requested. We support that they the say... Second, the second. Yeah, the second change is in, uh, in paragraph 14.2F1B1, uh, where it, it is maybe used or otherwise controlled and necessary infrastructure may be designated as P1 instead of will be designated as P1. And that's because, you know, these uses are allowed to be in other zones. And so it makes sense that you would have that be may and not will that all infrastructure or utilities have to be in P1 zones. They could be in these other zones too. Okay. So because what we see in public zones is that, you know, land gets purchased by the city down the line. We rezone it to P1 because it will be, it's a, it's an ownership designation right now. We're, because there are private uses that are already allowed, we're trying to kind of shift back towards the, the general use of zoning towards to control uses rather than ownership. Right. Okay. But go back to the, the part you don't support. Yeah. Um, I still don't understand how you can, you're talking about the public zone and suddenly you're talking about private ownership. How can you have private ownership of land in the public zone? Because the public zone is the name of a zoning designation. But it's all public land. You already said that. No, it's, it's, it's not. The uses allowed include basic utility uses. So if you go to the table 2F1, yep. there's a separate use, you know, for I like that table, ownership. And then you go down to basic utility uses, and that's where... You know, this is really the meat of it, where it talks about what uses are allowed. And, and if you look at the existing, not the table, but the existing list that they currently have, you know, we already allow privately owned communication transmission facilities in public zones. Uh, we don't specify whether utility scale ground mounted solar energy systems need to be publicly or privately owned. So there are, and plant based, plant related agriculture can also be public or private. So there are already some non-public uses that are allowed in public zones. It's just a little confusing as, as to how it's used currently. So the private ownership in that proposed change is referring to the actual thing, not to the land. No, it is referring to the land. Well, I thought it was, that's how I read it, but then I still don't understand how they can own the land. It's, this doesn't say that only public entities can own the land. It says if a public entity owns the land, it should be designated public. But to take that further, your definition of public zoning is a public entity owns the land. That's one part of it. It's not the only. Then there's an or statement that says or. It doesn't specify or private ownership. I, Staff, to, staff believes that because the way that zones work, that wasn't necessary. Right, and that's the purpose statement, and then yeah. you go to the uses. So together, all of it acknowledges right. the private ownership of the land and use for okay. uh, basic utilities. All right, that's all my questions. Thank you. I had just a, a totally unrelated question, I guess. Um, I was intrigued by the the striking the language under the P2 section where it talked about um, the designation and it serves as notice of function and owning and buying land proximity to public home, blah, blah, blah. Um, and the reason I was, I guess, questioning that is, honest to goodness, I didn't know that, pu pu that the state and federal government were exempt from utility or to ordinances until I joined this commission. 
And so to, to take that out um, from public information seems uh, odd or unwarranted. I think it, it didn't really, I don't think this language really does anything. <clears throat> and I think it well, I gets, agree. I don't think it does it other than inform the public. But it, it doesn't inform the public because, you know, I mean, when you go to buy my piece of land, I get an abstract for my piece of land. You know, I, I don't get an abstract that tells me what my neighboring property is designated. I mean, it will still be publicly available information, but we were trying to kind of get away from, again, this emphasis on the ownership. And it just didn't seem like um, this is, that this was particularly helpful um, information. Is there, is there any place else in the code or uh, where it, it explains to the public that state and federal government are exempt? I do not believe so. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that this, removing this doesn't change anything, right? The uses that are allowed in the P2 zone are still the same. Uh, and I don't think it's true to say it's not ordinarily subject to city <coughs> regulations because it is subject to city regulations. They just tend to be less onerous. So I, I don't like how it's currently written anyway. I think it's sort of misleading. Uh, so that was why uh, we were recommending striking that language. May I ask what prompted this, uh, this change? Sure, so, so the most immediate one is Mid-American has requested an amendment uh, for a South District substation potentially. Uh, we've also had this conversation <clears throat> basically any time Iman has come to us for utility cabinets. So there was one, one or two years ago. There was one maybe four years ago. And I think pretty much every time, you know, we have utilities that are looking in developing areas, this conversation pretty much comes up again. So it, it's been something that's been an ongoing discussion. You know, we found drafted language for this. It wasn't dated, but it was probably from four, four or more years ago. So it's been an ongoing discussion. We, we just decided to act on it now. And you feel like these, this verbiage helps navigate that conversation with more efficacy, or what are you thinking? So we think that it, it opens up opportunities for different locations for, for public uti or for utility uses, uh, and it prevents those issues where you, know, you need a utility use, you would have to have commercial zoning, our, our traditional commercial zoning to have that, and that leaves some risk that in the future that use leaves. You have commercial zoning there. It doesn't really mesh with a lot of our plans in some cases. And so that creates some complications. And so that's where we thought the P1 zone might be a good, uh, a good uh, alternative for that because you know, if that basic utility use leaves, there's pretty limited uses allowed within that P1 zone. Uh, and so it would probably have to be rezoned to be reused for anything other than uh, kind of those absolutely required infrastructure expenditures or for city or county use. Do you feel like this allows for a significant or um, an appropriate amount of protection for the neighboring community as well? I think that's where I'm like I'm thinking about the the new oh I forgot what the name of the subdivision is the the Hickory Trail like does that need a substation or a pumping station that then is going to take up the entirety of an acre of land or, you know, I don't know what those things look like. I'm not an engineer, but I'm just trying to think about what are the possible, um, how could this be a negative impact on those surrounding developments or residential uses? So I'm just trying to think about all of the pieces here. Sure. So thinking about 
you know, possible impacts, you're going to see one of two things. Either it's a pub public utility, like a pump station, a sewer lift station. Those are already provisionally allowed. They're approved either through subdivision or through site plan review. Um, those are allowed to use public zones. Um, if you have private infrastructure, you know, you're looking at commercial or industrial zoning that you have to use. Uh, and th those, in some cases, those things are needed. You, you, you know, you need, um, you need electric substations, you need utility hubs, you need all these things. And so looking at providing ways to do it, it still requires a rezoning. It would still go through the rezoning process. Okay. Uh, I would allow an opportunity for the public to, to be informed and uh, address it at that time. Um, if it's in an existing public zone, uh, it wouldn't go through a rezoning process, but you know, d depending on the use, uh, either the city or the county or the school district would control that land already. Uh, or so it still has to go through approval of, on some level. It would be similar to, to if you were going to rezone it commercial, it would still go through the same process. The difference is what you're left with at the end of the day is when it's rezoned, it's a public zone, there are pretty limited uses in what's allowed there. That's what you're saying. Versus a commercial zone where there's a much broader, allow, bro broader variety of uses that are allowed. Okay. And so staff saw this as, as a better alternative for, for some of those, especially developing areas. And if I could just add to that, if it didn't require a rezoning and it was something like a, an electrical substation, it would require a special exception. The neighborhood would be notified and oh, the sure. Board of Adjustment would uh, ha hold a public hearing on that. Great. Thank, that helps me clear that up. Thank you. And I think if it was an existing public zone, presumably that means that a public entity owns the land. And so either that would involve the sale of land to the private utility company, which would require public hearing, at least at the council level, or a lease, which again would require you know, public scrutiny uh, to allow that entity to come in and use the land. And it would be, you have to get fair market value for it. So um, we wouldn't just be giving away cool. use of publicly owned land for this private use out of curiosity this is not really related to this but as I was reading this I thought what are cell towers considered they're not public utilities no cell towers are considered I believe communications transmission facilities and so oh. that's already provisionally or allowed provisionally or by special exception okay and that was that's one of those uses that we have noted in our current code that it's privately owned is allowed. Uh, and what does the county do compared to what we do? Is it similar or? I did not look at the county's regulations regarding utilities. Because you could just surround the city with, you know, just wondering if, I, if they didn't have, I, I imagine they do something similar. So, so sometimes they require conditional use permits. Uh, I'm not sure if that's in every county zone, but I know that occasionally conditional use permits are required. And if you can. I will say one thing I know about the county's regulations is that they allow um, electrical substations in residential zones through a conditional use permit process. So similar to our special exception where it has to go to their board of adjustment. So that seems, just based on that, they're probably a bit more um, lenient than the city is in terms of their regulations. And, and it seems, like I said, like most other, the larger communities do generally allow these uses in residential zones, which surprised me a little bit in researching it. But Iowa City tends to be pretty restrictive in how we've regulated it. And I think it's, it's been a good thing, and that's why we don't want to you know, allow blanket utility uses wherever. But um, try and provide it in, in areas where it might be appropriate. It seems to make sense to us. So to go back to Susan's question about the private ownership language in you know, hey Mark, could there. you talk into oh. your microphone? To go back to Susan's uh, question about that. So I think I'm getting a better sense of why that's, um, at least why Mid-American is suggesting it is not a, a negative. Um, so we theoretically, you could have a piece of public land and they could request to purchase a piece of that land, pay money, at which point it becomes private land. Right. Um, so right. I guess that's what's happening now or the way it 
no, not happening now. He's like, <laughs> but so that's what it would kind of codify, if you will. Okay. It would it would allow, yeah, it would allow that to occur. My question is, how safe are these uh, basic utility uh, stations in residential areas? I guess I'm thinking about, I mean, I've, some have been there for years and years, but in these new uh, developments, I'm looking at the electrical, um, the electric, electrical hubs that are right, if they seem like they're right next to uh, residential areas. What's the safety factors involved with that? And is there anything that can be written into the zones that they're not, I mean, 200 feet doesn't sound like a very well, the, long the, distance. The 200 feet is in industrial zones. So they're allowed provisionally in industrial zones with 200 feet. And then also, mm -hmm. uh, again, screen for public rights of way to the S3 standard. That's the high screen. Um, and then also being closed by a fence uh, in industrial areas. In commercial areas, what we're looking at is, you know, if it's enclosed, then it's okay with, with no exterior uh, ability to tell that it's a utility um, and that's allowed provisionally and then it's not allowed if it's not allowed provisionally uh, it requires a special exception um, so that one of the criteria is that it has to be compatible with surrounding structures uh, with regards to safety size height scale location and design um, as part of that review it's reviewed by the board of adjustment they can place any condition um, with regards to you know if there's a safety concern that they have they can say you know, we, we think that it could be approved if it has walls that are X, X feet high, or, you know, this is really close to that elementary school. We really want to make sure that it's at least this far from the elementary school. Uh, you know, a lot of those things can be considered by the board because the board has pretty, it's got its general criteria that it's looking at, which includes general healthy, health, safety, comfort, and, and welfare. And then it does require that screening as well. That's part of the, the criteria. I guess I'm thinking about that um, new apartment complex right off of Prairie du Chien and, oh God, what is it, the street going? Foster? Yeah, yes. And it, there's a big electrical station. It looks like it's right next to the apartment complexes. And how did that happen? <laughs> it just seems like it's awful close to uh, that res those residential well, well, I believe it's in a commercial zone, and it was approved by the Board of Adjustment, and they, they were satisfied that it was safe and that it's uh, a location for it. How do we keep that from happening in the future, I guess, is the question. Um, amend the zoning code, I, I suppose, if council um, was interested in that. If but. a rezoning came up before you that you didn't support, you know, you could have a voice then. Yeah, because I, I think we actually said okay to that. <laughs> Do the electrical units be in there? I mean, we approved the, uh, the complexes, but did we know that they were going to set those? I seem to recall that that was the plan for that land, yeah. I didn't yeah. remember that. Okay. But I hear what you're saying. I mean, I... It just doesn't look very safe to me, <laughs> and it's brand new. <laughs> and it's during my time. Maria? I have a question, yeah. So my, my first question was like, um, I, th I think you already talked about this, but do you have another example of something that is privately owned that is in P1 zone? So, um, you know, a building or something private that is in P1 zone. Can you give me an example? Other than the cell towers. <clears throat> I think right now that's all that's really allowed. That's the only thing? Yeah. Okay. Agri Utility scale solar is also allowed in public right. zones. And if you recall, there was, um, an, the city was working with Mid-American Energy to get a solar facility out by the water treatment plant. Uh -huh. um, city Council ultimately said no to that, but that use is allowed in public zones. Okay. Um, and then I had another question, but I don't know if it's relevant. Um, anything that is in in anything that is built in a land in a piece of land that is P1, would that become a public building? No, so it's separate. No. Okay. Okay, and my other question is like, is there a way? Will there be a way to know that whatever is built will serve the area that is currently in? So, is there a radius maximum that you say, okay, this 
equipment that is going to be here has to serve this radius. There is no requirement with that. So there could be potentially they could build something that serves something that is farther away, another area. Potentially, I suppose. But by the, the, the definition is by nature those things that are close. So, you know, you, so can, you can build a pump possible. station, but the pump station is going to have to be close to what it's used because, right, right. you know, okay. it's being used for that purpose. So maybe it helps Probably. people way upstream, but it's... Okay. So it depends on what you classify as the area and all those things. But we, there are no standards regarding that that we require. Okay. Those were all my questions. If, if I could just add to that, too, in the conversations we've had with IMON that are looking for utility hub sites, they, based on our conversations, they're trying to address gaps that exist in the community. And there's a very kind of small area in which they can locate those hubs and fill that gap. So I think even though maybe theoretically what you're asking could happen, I don't think practically it would. Okay. Any additional questions of members of the commission for staff? Seeing none. Thank you, Kirk. Now we'll go ahead and open the public hearing. And uh, sir, if you'd uh, sign in and give us your name. I'll sign in. Uh, my name is Chris Pose. Uh, I'm an attorney. My office address is 317 6th Avenue, Suite 300 in Des Moines. And I'm here on behalf of Mid-American Energy Company. I want to make sure I sign this paper. I, I, um, as I didn't teach school, I can't do two things at once. <laughs> <laughs> On behalf of Mid-American Energy, we're in support of the staff's request to amend the P1 zone. In short, it gives more flexibility to the city to allow uh, land that would otherwise have to be zoned commercial or industrial to be zoned something as public for something that is more a permanent improvement, in this case, an electric substation, is what drove the discussion. And we first learned of this when we did the Foster Road substation, where Mid-American owned a piece of land on the uh, east side of Prairie du Chien and wanted to use it for a substation and the city said no we don't want to use it you should use a commercial piece and so we went across the street and used that but we were then made aware that the public zoning classification if it were to be used is very restrictive it's only for things that are owned by public institutions in which case Mid-American is not that so we couldn't use that zone for this purpose it came, a, it came about again in the last couple of years as we're looking to put a substation near the south area of the city. And much of that area is undeveloped, but yet has a comprehensive plan designation for it. And for us to take a piece of land that is um, in the comprehensive plan and zone it commercial or industrial, just put a substation seemed a bit much. And so this P1 district solution seemed to be a good solution. Um, with the staff. In other words, we would zone something not commercial or industrial, but we would zone it P1 and enable us to use it for an electric substation. We would still have the same approval requirements that we'd have in a commercial district um, to go to the Zoning Board of Adjustment with that request and have the Zoning Board of Adjustment review it and make sure it was appropriate. And indeed, that's what happened with the Foster Road substation a few years ago um, on Prairie du Chien and Foster Drive. Um, so we'd have those same things. Our present technical correction with the staff concerns um, section 14.2.F.1 and the definitional sections, which still seem to have this vestige of you can only do this if the land is publicly owned. And I don't know, Ann, can you put up that thing I sent this morning, which is a clean version, um, clean meaning no red line, um, and red marks in there to confuse anything. But I went ahead and took 14.2.F.1, and there it is. Ooh, it's small. Let's see. Um, let's see if we can. Yeah. They'll also have it on your screen. You might have it on your screen. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, yeah, we have it. Okay. Yeah. So if you read that. But we have a video input box right in the middle of our screen, Ann. So I don't know. Out yeah. of range. You can read video around it. Know what that is, Kirk? I do not. There you go. <laughs> there oh, there it is. Our, our discussion, I should start with, and went away. I should I start with this. Our discussion with the staff here is a friendly one. We both want the same thing. 
We want an ordinance that is well written and can stand the test of any legality check. And my concern on behalf of BitAmerican is, unless we get this right, for what we're doing in the P1 with the substation, we're gonna have to go to the Board of Adjustment anyway. And if the Board of Adjustment makes a decision that somebody doesn't like, it can be appealed to a district court. And a district court could decide whether or not this ordinance says public or private ownership. And so I wanna get this correct, uh, because I think the intent clearly is to let something that is owned privately, and MidAmerican wants to own land that it builds these substations on. It's a lot of equipment. They don't want to put that on a leased facility or anything that is city owned. Um, but if you read the purpose statement now, and this is after the city's proposed amendments, the purpose of the public zones is to provide reference to public ownership and use of land, or to use of the land for infrastructure services that need to be located in or around, near the area where the service is provided. You can see there that public ownership is mentioned, but not private ownership. And the term infrastructure services, use of land for infrastructure purposes or services, is not defined in the city ordinance. I don't know what infrastructure services are um, by definition in the city. On the other hand, basic utility uses are defined in the city code and include such things as substations. The second place where this becomes an issue about ownership is in the neighborhood P1 zone. <laughs> the statement says, uses such as schools, parks, police, and fire stations, and other civic buildings owned or otherwise controlled by the, the county, the city, or the Iowa City Community School District, and necessary infrastructure, again, this term that's not defined so that I know what it is, um, will be designated as P1 neighborhood public zone. Now, staff has said they would agree with the change of will to May, and the reason we suggested that is um, not every substation we would do has to be a P1. It can still go to a commercial zone if that's appropriate. So we don't want to say will. But in that list, I don't see, um, and I don't think you folks see, a private utility as listed um, that could be within that classification. So I think that brings us back to the red and blue um, version that uh, maybe you guys would have to switch it, uh, that I had proposed. And do you have they, a, no, they have a copy, though, yeah, they have at their a desk. Copy. Have a copy. I wanted to show this to you because, so you could see clearly, without all the red and the blue, the, the problem that I want to solve. And the problem I want to solve is to make sure that a privately owned um, piece of land can be used for a public utility and used in P1. So um, you have it up there, or do you have it in your yep. hand? Yeah. Yep. The red and blue. Yep. Um, I think because it says, uh, the, the blue I've added, you can see, because it says public ownership, I want to be clear that it could be private ownership too. Uh, because MidAmerican, while they're a public <laughs> utility company, uh, in the broad sense, they are privately owned. And so we need, since there's public ownership referenced in the, the section, and I added in basic, ut or basic utility as language because that is a defined term in the code, and that includes such things as substations. Um, in the second paragraph, you see that I've added or privately owned for basic utility services so that it's included with the county, the city, the school district. And I intend my corrections that I've submitted, again, to help the ordinance do what the staff wants it to do. Um, and make sure that if we go forward with a substation, because it's going to have to go to the Board of Adjustment anyway, that all of the ordinance provisions indicate that that use can be allowed in the district. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, I noticed, you know, questions about, I don't think this is intended to replace anything in the franchise that the city has with MidAmerican, where MidAmerican can go down public streets and cross trails, because those all have to be approved by the city anyway. Um, any kind of construction that's in a public land, um, they'd have the right to cover it. We're wanting to use this so that it solves a, a problem, um, and more problems within the city, not creates them. I have a question for you, since you're trying to clean it up. Um, I just found it odd how it references particularly the Iowa City Community School District. If Iowa City in the future annexes land and we annex into a neighboring school district, then this 
particular amendment then would not apply. Is that correct? Um, I'd have to defer to how you would treat that, but I would think you'd want to amend it if another school district came in um, because it does list them specifically. I just found it was odd that it was listed in particularity when there are adjacent <coughs> school districts to Iowa City. So that's it. Um, did you have any other? I noticed that sometimes I was watching you and you're shaking your head either. Oh, no, you were, I think you were saying, I think that some of the questions came up about um, would. For the type of facility that MidAmerican has here, a substation use, this was one of the main discussions we had with staff. There's too much investment of equipment there for that to be something that we would just place on public land. And so I, I was gesturing more to, and it's close of what would happen, and I can't remember all the circumstances that, that came up. And as a commission, you have to look at all of them. But some of the things that were happening or that were described were not really likely um, and aren't intended by um, these ordinance drafts. The staff's also trying to do some other things here, like for, would you say, IMACON or IM? I'm on. I'm on. There we go. Um, for I'm on that we're not really focused on. We're focused more on the having a chance to solve a problem in the South District and have an ordinance that's well written for the future if we ever have to zone land P1. Substations, the electric substations we deal with, um, number one, they take power from transmission lines, the bigger lines that run through the community, and they downsize it to, from 161,000 volts to 13,500 volts. So by definition, they need to be near a transmission line. And Mid-American's general circus er or surface area that they want to cover is three miles. They want these about once every three miles and have redundancy so that if your lights go out, some station goes out because of a storm, the other one can cover it. And the south area is growing quickly. Um, the north area where Prairie du Chien and Foster Road, that grew quickly too, and we had to put a substation into an existing, residen existing and developing residential area, which is a very different problem than we have down in the south where we want to get it in there before the development happens and allow the everyone to see that it's there. And most times what you find is um, when you get it there first, it gets absorbed very quickly. Um, and nobody blinks an eye at it. If we try to do this where people can see it when they couldn't before, then there's questions. Um, but they're a necessary animal um, for development of the community and they supply the distribution power that's necessary to light the buildings, light the streets. Well, the street lights are on solar cells, I think, but light the buildings, do the security lighting, anything that's electrical is running because it comes from a distribution substation somewhere like we're trying to do here. Um, they're not trying to prop or to over proliferate the area with them by any means. It's a big investment and good for the community. Any additional questions from commissioners of Mr. Pose? Thank, Thank you. you. And seeing no other member of the public present, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing. Um, I do have a question of staff, though. I know we're out of order here, but um, I guess I'm really looking at Sarah. Like that thing about Iowa City Community School District, that seems overly specific. I mean, or would if, if you ever annex in the future, you just simply amend this to, so if it's Clear Creek Amana School District, if we, Iowa City, grew out to there it, it may be i'm this could be so theoretical it's just tell me to be quiet and i'm fine well but. it's really not something that i <laughs> thought about other than um you know the school district is not a subdivision of the federal state or local government so in order for them to be included in this we have historically specifically named them i mean it it's not meant to apply, I, th I think the idea is it's not meant to apply to private schools. Um, Would some language just, uh, or, or public school um, organization or uh, would something like that be I I, I don't or? know enough about okay. how the school districts are structured to okay. say one way or the other. Um, yeah. I'm, I think it's fine. Yeah, I, I'm 
been overly it can always, picky and yes, it, can, it can be I, it can be changed. I am fine I think with that. You are. But I want to ask Sarah as long as we're out of order here and you started it. Um, <laughs> so why do you think that the first part of the amendment proposed by Mid America is not necessary? Uh, I was going to ask the same thing. Because uh, it's just a purpose statement. And again, the meat of the uses that are allowed are down in that table. Okay. I think the language that we have proposed regarding the purpose is broad enough and is more consistent with other purpose statements for other zones. Does it hurt anything? Well, I didn't like how it just said private ownership uh, or use. There was something about way it was phrased. I thought, well, that could be interpreted to just open the door wide open for private. Well, it was confusing to me when I read it, which is why I asked so many questions yeah. about it. Yeah. Um, but then when you see it in the chart, it makes more sense. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that was our thought that yeah. um, and the, the the infrastructure services that's more or less the definition of basic utility but the um, oh, the transmission mm. yeah those aren't technically regulated I don't think as those are considered another use and so I didn't want that purpose statement to be too narrow by using a defined term. Um, again, it's supposed to be the purpose statement. The uses that are allowed are in the table. Um, the communication transmission facility use is considered an other use, not a basic utility use. And so if you just say basic utility use, I think that's too narrow of a purpose statement. So those are some of the um, conversations we had <laughs> leading up to this draft language. All right. Thank you very much. Now we'll go ahead and close the public hearing since I'm completely out of order. So, so a question on um, what would staff recommendation read? Because it's not the same as what's in our packet then, correct? Oh, the last the you shall is the, the only. Blue part. Only different. Oh, staff. Except okay. by changing, yeah. we're changing not to shall okay. or may. Just making sure right. the staff Following is appro <laughs> approving that in B1. Okay. Well, can I have a motion before we discuss how, this? How about the, I would, I would propose a, to move as adopted as presented maybe with the inclusion of so after the phrase and necessary infrastructure um i just had it in my head such as privately owned basic utility will be designated as p1 does that is that a middle ground where the basic utility is at least referenced in there does that make sense So can you read it again? So yes, yeah, so it would be an Iowa City Community School District and necessary infrastructure. Hold on, hold on. Okay, Sorry. We're, we're not in the purpose statement. I am on the no. as presented. B, B1. B1, sorry, B1. zone designations. Okay, yes. Isn't that where the, the bulk of the change? Yeah, up above yeah. I think it was in the purpose It was in the, you're right, it was in the purpose. The sorry. Designation. Okay. What I'm trying to do is shoehorn the word basic utility, private owned basic utility in there somewhere. So it is at least included as a as an example of infrastructure services, if that's not overly redundant. I mean, again, I think the definition of basic utility is infrastructure services that need to be located. Okay. Then I, I move to adopt as presented by staff. Except for the May to at will. Thank you. And then that, Susan said. And that motion includes the uh, attachment one, the table 2F-1, principal uses allowed in public zones. Oh, yeah. Because isn't that the fundamental meat yeah. and potatoes of yeah. this? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I don't have that in print. Okay. All right. So we got a motion by Nolte. Is second. there a second? And we've got a second by Science. Discussion? Um, I think everybody can tell by the discussion that hmm. 
this is a complicated topic as far as um, trying to foresee <laughs> how the public will perceive this. Um, many of us, Mr. Poe's been doing this a long time, and our, as soon as we hear public lands and private uses, we immediately think about how the public's going to react. So we want to make sure we're covering all our bases and getting all the discussion out there right up front. Um, I feel pretty comfortable with what I've heard now. I initially had lots of questions that I think have been resolved. Hmm. Uh, uh, how, which, um, with the version that we just ended up on? You're, you're I, I think just um, with the version we just ended up on, but mostly the discussion of, about how that applies and what the things mean. Because yeah. I just wrote down some comments that uh, we're probably just my imagination running in different directions. Well, I think it's just keeping up with the times. And as the city grows and as the amount of utilities that that people need, I mean, 30 years ago, whoever thought they need internet service at their house, for God's sakes. <laughs> um, you know, it just, it's keeping up with the times and it sounds like the staff has worked well with you know the vent the suppliers of those utility services and the city needs it so i completely agree we can't have a healthy city and a growing city without utilities i mean they just can't happen and i really like the idea of trying to get this um, substation placed early so then development can occur around it and everybody's exactly. completely aware yep. of it rather than placing it retrospectively yes. oh yes because we will hear about it otherwise yes. <laughs> I'm, I, you know, I, I, not sure I have a problem either way with the blue or without the blue. Um, I, I, I hear both sides. Um, I, I'm, I'm comfortable with voting for the for the uh, uh, propo the pro proposed amendment. Yeah, I support the um, the staff version of the amendment. The only thing that I have concerns about is like the way this structures all these these buildings will look and i wonder if we can put a requirement of like have them be covered with green like with plants or um you know native trees or or maybe use the some of the walls of these structures to put like um public art from local artists or and I know there was something that said that we can request that, um, consider having them be brick. Um, that's my only concern. Do, but, yeah. Does this, um, it, there, is a, there is the S3 screening requirement? Yes. That would still come into play here, is that right? Yes. Yes. And if anything going to the BOA, then they can add additional requirements. Oh, oh yeah, okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Hearing no nays, motion passes unanimously. I have to excuse myself. All right. Thank you, Mark. Take care. Uh, if we can know for the record that Commissioner Nolte is uh, leaving the meeting for a, another appointment. Now we'll go to item number five, case number REZ22-0007, consideration of an amendment to Title 14. Zoning to allow a door connecting a drinking establishment, <laughs> establishment to a sales-oriented retail use and not consider it an expansion if certain criteria are satisfied. Anne. Thank you, Chair. We're on to our second of three, I guess, Woo! text amendments of this evening. <laughs> Who knew they would take this long? I <laughs> <laughs> Mark was going to get us all snacks. <laughs> <laughs> So as the and chair it could mentioned, be in a this place is that's attached to some place that serves alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> this is an amendment um, relating to our standards uh, for drinking establishments. A little bit of background: uh, back in 2009, the st city established a separation distance requirement uh, between drinking establishments, and so it was a 500-foot minimum separation distance. And this was due to concerns of over-concentration of these uses in the downtown and underage drinking. It was uh, applied citywide in 2009, and then in 2013, an, um, another amendment was passed that restricted that uh, separation distance requirement just to the university impact area and riverfront crossings. Thanks, Kirk. 
For those existing drinking establishments that didn't meet that 500 foot minimum um, separation distance requirement, they were allowed to continue if the use did not change and if their liquor license was in good standing. Um, and expansions of that use were only allowed in certain um, circumstances such as rooftop cafes. Last year, you may remember that an amendment came forward to the commission and to council related to allowing non-conforming drinking establishments to continue where economically viable business substitutes were not found for locally designated historic buildings. And that amendment was brought forward due to the Tailwinds project, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. It's the one downtown in the Ped Mall. And so the, the, this amendment that is proposed tonight is also a, a result of that project. Uh, the developers would like to modify the structure at 111 East College Street, which will house reunion, brew pub, and restaurant to internally connect to a sales-oriented retail use plan for the building to the east at 115 East College Street. And without this proposed amendment, that would be considered an expansion of a non-conforming drinking establishment and not allowed. So what staff is um, proposing tonight is an amendment that would amend the definition of enlargement and expansion to note that a door connecting a drinking establishment to a sales-oriented retail use would not be considered an expansion. And it also proposes to amend the city's non-conforming provisions for drinking establishments. It outlines specific criteria that must be met if uh, a non-conforming drinking establishment wants to have a door between that use and a sales-oriented retail use. Some of those requirements are that the door have the same fire resistive rating as the wall and be ADA compliant. They must post a notice that alcohol is prohibited in the sales-oriented retail use, and that staffing must be sufficient to monitor patrons to prevent violations. The proposed amendment also gives authority to the police chief to close the door if open container violations occur. The proposed amendment is narrow, narrow, narrowly tailored. Um, it only applies to a door between a drinking establishment and a sales-oriented retail use, not another use like an office use or some other type of use next to a drinking establishment. Um, Sales-oriented retail use are not allowed to have a liquor license. They are allowed to sell accessory alcohol sales for off-site consumption if it's less than 25% of the gross yearly income. And additionally, it gives authority to the police chief to, to close the door if violations occur. So at, at this point, um, staff would recommend approval of this amendment that uh, concludes my presentation. Any questions for staff from members of the commission regarding this application, or question. this recommendation, amendment? I have whatever. a question. Um, so what if that retail shop participates in First Fridays? Can they not offer wine to their patrons? <laughs> <laughs> I, Just you know, <laughs> yeah, I know that happens. Um, I don't know if that requires a liquor license for something like that. It? We just don't talk about it. I, I actually am not well versed in what requires a liquor license and what doesn't, so I really can't answer that if, if it's a violation or not. But they on here you're saying open container, although it's carried cup. through carried through the through door. The door. Yeah. Oh, carried through the door. Oh, fine then. I think that might be our well, saving grace here. No, I think if you're <laughs> if you don't have a liquor license, you're not supposed to be uh, providing wine to the public, but. Again, I don't know um, through what mm, process. I, I don't know much about first this First Fridays uh, thing. So everything I just said, strike from the record. <laughs> <laughs> I have so you're going to have a lot of really cranky wine drinkers on your hand. <laughs> I assume that that there's some reason for this. I mean, I don't know. It feels like a lot of work for something that I personally can't quite comprehend why they care. At first I thought, well, maybe it's like a fire exit or something, and they got to go through that door to get 
out to somewhere or I think I, I hear what you're saying, and I think down below it it, yeah. it says if they want to have a little they want to have a little shop that sells reunion merchandise, so they want to be able to go from the bar to their little shop that sells their t-shirts and their hats and their stuff like that. But are they at does that mean then that they're at capacity for the size of a establishment that sells booze? They don't they, wanna... They're a non-conforming drinking establishment, so they can't, it would be considered an expansion, but through adding the door, it would be considered an expansion of, of the non-conforming drinking establishment. So I do have a map here. I don't know if this is helpful, but um, where, where it says Sears Building, that's where the Reunion Brewery will be. Where it says Dooley Block on the west side, that's where we allowed them to expand into due to the previous amendment from 2021. And then where it's the Dooley block on the east, that's where they want to have the retail establishment. So there would be a door connecting those two buildings, and that's where they would sell their merchandise. I'll also have access to restrooms then. Right now the first floor of the brewery would not have restrooms, but if they are allowed to cut this door in, they will have access to those additional bathrooms. Those bathrooms aren't required by code. Um, it's just more of a convenience to the customers to, to be able to use that. So even though the Dooley Block piece says bar restaurant, it's not really. It's that, that will be bar a bar restaurant. The one on the, oh, the, the right that says retail. I was looking at the Dooley Block on my left. Yeah. You're talking about the one in the middle. Yeah, to the right of the right. Sears Correct. building. Yeah. The easterly one. Or the opera I, house. I, fine, it's fine. <laughs> no, because I also understood, she understood, I thought you said the one that say, says retail right now is the extension, and then the one on the left is going to become the retail. No, the one on the right is retail. The one on the left is an expansion. Okay, that's what I understood, okay. too. I was, yeah. yeah. I was confused. Thank you. The map was very helpful, Ann. Thank oh, you. Oh, good. <laughs> Additional questions for staff? Nope. Seeing none, we'll open the public hearing. Seeing no public present, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing. Is there a motion? I move to accept staff's proposal. Second. Motion by Craig. Second by Martin. Discussion? Uh, the only discussion I'd say is I, it seems to me that very similar things I've uh, experienced when on vacation going to touristy areas where you have a restaurant bar area and there's like a gift shop off to the side. You know, good luck keeping drink people drinking yeah. from carrying their drink with them into the other place, but that's not our problem. I mean, that's covered. So, any other discussion? No. Oh. Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Hearing no nays, the, ma the motion passes unanimously. Now we are on to zoning code text amendment item number six, case number REZ22-0004. This is consideration of an amendment to Title 14, zoning to clarify requirements and ensure compliance with changes to state law. Kirk. Thank you. So this one is, staff keeps an ongoing list of small things that we need to change, clean up, whether that's in reaction to state law, whether it's in uh, to codify interpretations that we've made over the years and we want to, want to make sure is clear to the public, uh, whether it's to, to clarify standards that aren't you know, laid out in any way that people can, can figure out, um, or even to uh, ease staff administration. So we have this list of things that we do. I've got 11 for you today, so we're, I'll try to make them quick. Um, most of them are pretty straightforward. Um, one, we we had a public comment, uh, a public request from the chair of the Historic Preservation Historic Preservation Commission that they would like to review it first. So we'll we'll talk about that when we get to it. Um, and then one that is pretty complicated regarding short-term rentals. So you'll have to bear with me on that one. So the first one is uh, with regards to circulation uh, for pedestrians uh, in cases of redevelopment. So what this one does is add provisions to single family site development standards and site plan review design uh, criteria that would allow the city to require the construction of sidewalks within public rights of way 
Currently, there are no standards that allow that. Uh, you can do it within private rights of, or private property, but not within the public rights of way, uh, unless you have some sort of zoning code condition where you can where you can tack that on. Um, so, what we're really trying to do is improve conductivity, especially with infill and redevelopment, uh, and this would allow us to require that. Um, technically, you only have to make a recommendation on that first part because the second part's in the site plan title 18, which is not in the zoning code, uh, but it, it's related. So, I figured I I would provide it to you for informational purposes. The second one is regarding uh, how we interpret the historic preservation exception that's allowed within residential and commercial zones. Um, so it does allow some flexibility in historic preservation properties, but like I said, uh, the chair, we received correspondence where the chair of the Historic Preservation Commission would like uh, the Historic Preservation Commission to review it, uh, and so staff recommends striking this uh, as part of our recommendation. Can you pause for a second? Yes. Are we gonna, should, can we vote on these as you say them? Or do, are we going to hear all of them and then we have to remember them? I think it'd be simpler if the motion is made that way that we approve them all as recommended by staff. And then if that's the wish of the commission to defer to a future meeting, item number two, clarify historic preservation exception applicability. What if we don't like other parts of other ones? Uh, well, then you make an amendment. Make a different motion. Okay. Well, let me get a pen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and for this one, staff recommends just addressing it later. We have some other code cleanup items that we still have pending. There's going to be changes to state law, so we figure, you know, this is kind of an ongoing thing, so okay. we'll, we'll bring this one back later. Are, are you? Go for it. Okay. Um, I'll, yep, go. We're just going to keep trucking for a little bit. <laughs> This one uh, is regarding, is the goal is to clarify the applicability of form-based code design review. Um, so right now, uh, we have language that says form-based code districts uh, have design review, but that really was only meant to apply to the Riverfront Crossings District due to the large scale of development that you see there. Uh, we did recently adopt form-based code uh, for developing areas, uh, more recently in the South District is what we're looking at, uh, possibly expanding that to other parts of the city. Um, but those are, we plan on administering through site plan review and building permit review. And so we just want to clarify this, that that's only for riverfront crossings. Uh, and that's the only one that requires design review and that it does not apply to these other form-based zones. Uh, the next one is with regards to the approval criteria for variances. Um, so right now there's five approval criteria that are required for, for variances. Uh, the Board of Adjustment might, must make the findings that all of these are met in order to grant it. However, those criteria are not exactly aligned with state law and they're not exactly aligned with case law. And, and there's case law and state law that, that really guides what can have a variance and what can't have a variance. There have been some examples where variances that were granted were overturned by state courts due to these standards. So what this does is try to align our variance criteria with that state law uh, and the state code. Uh, and that makes it clearer for applicants and for staff and the board as to what uh, would actually uh, be qualified for a variance based under that state law. With regards to utility ground-mounted solar energy systems, uh, there's a requirement that there's a 200-foot buffer from residential zones. Uh, we've had some questions on that in the past as to where that's measured from, and so this clarifies that it's from the boundary of the residential zone. Uh, the next one is with regards to bicycle parking. Um, so this one, one of the things that we've run into as staff is we have bicycle park, minimum bicycle parking standards, but it's not really clear as to what that means in terms of what bicycle parking looks like. Uh, it leaves a lot of ambiguity, and so staff has been using some rules of thumb. Uh, we've been looking at the essentials of bike parking, uh, which is uh, made by the Association of Pedestrian Bicycle Professionals. Uh, but again, that's kind of rules of thumb. It's not codified, and so what staff wanted to do is take some of those rules, put them into the code to make it clearer to applicants what we expect for bicycle parking. So it adds in a minimum bicycle parking space, which would be one and a half by six feet. Uh, it adds in a minimum bicycle access aisle width of four feet. Uh, it requires that bicycle racks be installed two feet from curbs and or other obstructions or parking spaces. 
and it specifies that bicycle parking facilities must be in a visible location. So it's really just clarifying, you know, what are the expectations of staff with regard to these bicycle parking spaces, making sure that things are usable for the public. The next section is with regards to a couple provisions that we have for privately owned signs in public places. So right now there's a section in the, in the sign code that talks about um, when can privately owned signs be allowed in public places. Sometimes we see this come up uh, like in the entrances to subdivisions, for example, you might see it in a right of way. Um, one of those special provisions provides a cross reference and is redundant. And, and the other gives the city manager authority to allow signs in public places, uh, which may violate state code requirements for conveying an interest in public property for private use. So staff just recommends striking those two uh, conditions as, as, as being unneeded in the zoning code. The next change is to clarify the definition for family. So this one came about uh, when in 2018, the state restricted the ability of the city to regulate uh, the occupancy of homes uh, by familiar or non-familial non -familial relationships. Prior to that time, we had a definition of family that we used to define you know, what is a single family with a very specific use for family. Um, but since that time, you know, we've pretty much used family and household synonymously. Uh, and so what this does is, is it codifies this interpretation that staff has been using. And then it also does uh, open up um, a housing for a wider variety of household arrangements. And so it is best practice for fair housing to, to try and define a family this way. So what this does is, again, takes family and, and basically refers you to the definition for households. So that, uh, that would be the definition that we would be using. And the reason we don't propose striking it is because family is throughout the code. And so we just are going to cross-reference it and, and not have to remove it from every other part of our code. The next one is the definition for tree. So this is partially because of ambiguity uh, for our definition. So small tree currently is defined as having a height of up to 50 feet, whereas a large tree is having a height of greater than 40 feet. That obviously creates a gap in which it's ambiguous as to whether it's a tall or small tree. Um, and then also in recent conversations with the city forester, they had said 30, 30 feet is probably a better uh, height for what's actually a small versus a large tree. Uh, and so this justification changes it to a small tree is a height of up to 30 feet and a large tree is greater than 30 feet. Uh, so it removes that gap uh, and it, it uh, changes it to, the, to what the foresters internally think a, a small versus large tree should be. Uh, it may have a small impact on the number of trees planted because standards differ based on large versus small trees, uh, but staff believes that that uh, is gonna be a pretty small impact. So uh, doesn't believe that that is a concern. Now this brings us to the complicated one. <clears throat> this is another one um, that is re reacting to state law changes where recently um, the state restricted the ability of cities to regulate short-term rentals. Uh, this just passed in 2020. Uh, we made some changes to the housing code, but this is kind of catching up with the zoning code. Uh, and, and what this means is short-term rental, very, very broadly defined in this state law. So it's basically, any residential property that is for sale, or I mean that is rented for a fee for 30 days or less um, is exempt or can't be regulated, except for in a couple certain circumstances, such as you can do inspections, you can get contact information, um, some smaller things. And so what this uh, amendment seeks to do is bring us into compliance with state law. So we remove references to length of tenancy from our use categories. And so we see that in our residential use categories, in our commercial use categories, and then we also see it in our institutional use categories. Um, we also consolidate our definitions for bed and breakfast. So we currently have two, we have bed and breakfast in and a bed and breakfast homestay, which varies based on the number of people that are allowed to stay. What this does is puts them into one category called bed and breakfasts, and it's any number of guests up to 30 days. So it's essentially a short-term rental, but this is an accessory use category. So it has to be in addition to some other um, residential use. Um, and so, so we create this definition, and then we also strike any provisional standards that previously applied to these bed and breakfast categories, and, and only have those things that we can regulate apply to this bed and breakfast category. 
Um, so the reason we did it this way was because, A, it's a lease change approach. Um, there are existing bed and breakfasts that are accessory to single family uses, and we didn't want to make those all non-conforming by you know, just cutting the definition of bed and breakfast and saying, you're non-conforming as soon as you end your use, then you can't, you can't resume. So we wanted to make sure that that was the case. Uh, we also obviously wanted to make sure that we're in compliance with state law. Um, now that's the accessory side. If it's a primary use, it all depends on how it's structured as to what you'd be classified as. Hmm. So if you are a single family home and you're rented to a single household unit, which would be our definition of a single family, then you're considered a single family if even if you're rented out uh, for as long as you're rented out for 30 days or less, uh, you'd be considered single family. Now, if you're renting out individual rooms and they're all independent, they're not living as a household unit, then you would be considered group living uses, which is much more strictly regulated. Uh, that would not be allowed in most zoning districts. And so that's how we've been interpreting, you know, we have to treat these short-term rentals like every other use. So it really depends on the structure of how many people it's being rented to? Are those people acting as a household unit? And that's really the same determination that we make when we're looking at the primary use anyway. Uh, the only difference is that it's less than 30 days or, or greater than 30 days. So that's how I was treated with the regular. Um, we talked about you know making non-conforming uses, but we, we decided that we didn't want to do that. So this is what we settled on is kind of that lease change approach where we can continue to allow these. Now, w one repercussion of that is that it would make these accessory uh, bed and breakfast uses uh, more widely available. Uh, it wouldn't have restrictions on parking because those aren't things that we can regulate. Uh, it would only require that there are housing inspections every two years and that there's contact information that's updated uh, and that they have to stay there less than 30 days. So that's what we settled on. Uh, it's been a long, complicated discussion. Um, but uh, we, we think that this meets you know, the state code and we think that it, it meets the goals of the city based on uh, the code that we have and, and what we're looking to do. Then finally, this is another one that's for informational purposes with, uh, we wanted to clarify the boundary line adjustment standards. So those are in the subdivision code, typically doesn't come to you, but I wanted to include it all in one so that when it comes to council, it's a little easier for us. Uh, this one, Currently, minor boundary line adjustments are if it's less than 1,000 square feet and you're transferring property from one abutting property to another abutting property. Um, however, there's no, there's no process for if it's larger than 1,000 feet. Um, so what we're just doing is creating a distinction between a minor boundary line adjustment, which is our current process, and a major one. And the minor one doesn't go through administrative review, but the major one would. And that's what we've been informally doing currently. Um, we just want to make sure that it's codified so that uh, the process is clear for for those uh, who wish to sell property to abutting property owners. <clears throat> and so public comment, we did receive the letter from the chair. And so like I said, uh, we've just recommended striking that section. And based on that, staff recommends uh, amending the zoning code uh, as is included in um, attachment one of the staff report other than to strike the provisions uh, relating to the historic preservation exception at 14.2a, 7b, 14.2b, 8a, and 14.2c, 11a, with the intent to address that in a later code cleanup. So with that, if you have any questions for me, it's a lot of information, and I hope, hopefully did an okay job of uh, presenting it. All right, Phoebe, go. Okay. <laughs> okay, so for the first one, is this, Am I reading it to s clarify for me? Um, there are, you know, go to Alphabet City and you have no sidewalks. Go down um, Rochester Court and there are no sidewalks. Are you saying there need to be sidewalks added or is this just for new site development? So this is for infill development, but we did add in provisions for you know, it has to improve pedestrian connectivity. So in some cases, you may have a house that doesn't have a sidewalk for whatever reason, and the abutting properties have it. And currently, if it's being redeveloped, you would never be able to require sidewalks. But what this does is allows the city to do it. Uh, we also have language in here that- oh, Sorry, back up. Allows the city to say- To say you have to put in a sidewalk as part of either site plan review as a part of your building permit review. If there was- Sorry, work with me here. Yeah. So you have one house that, for whatever reason, has this tiny bit of sidewalk, but the other two houses do not. 
So if this house wants to remodel, do they then have to connect their sidewalk? Potentially. So it, it doesn't require it, but it allows the city to require it. So if there are cases, let's say, that none of the houses on a side have a sidewalk, it doesn't make any sense to put in a sidewalk because that doesn't improve pedestrian connectivity. So the city doesn't have to require it. But this allows the city to require it. Let's say, so if you have a house that has one and one that doesn't and another one that has one, you could require that, that it connect sense. across. I see what you're saying. So, so that's the goal of it for those infill situations. But if it's an entire block face that doesn't have it, the city wouldn't have to require that or anything. Okay. Why did you guys, why are you doing this one? Uh, it's been a item that staff has discussed is something that that's currently a gap within our code and a, a gap in pedestrian connectivity. So staff is bringing forth its, its items today. Okay, thank you. Oh. Anyone? And most of those areas are in older neighborhoods. I mean, I'm thinking of a, there's a block on Friendship Street. Oh, yeah. West of, of First. first. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, it drives me crazy, the lack of sidewalks. And then there'll be a house that has a sidewalk and one that doesn't and one that does. And I think the city should have put a sidewalk on the new park, but then they didn't ask me, so. Um, <laughs> Okay, can I ask another question? Or Keep yours. shooting unless other people have questions. Yeah. <laughs> uh, talk to me about number seven because I remember being on PNZ when so, when this was a big hullabaloo. And Remind me which one is seven. Oh, seven is uh, signs. 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 Probably own signs. Yeah, um, and it went to the Supreme Court that there was like a church thing like church signs on pu on easements or pu on public right-of-ways. So walk me through, what do you exactly want to have happen here? So th there's currently <clears throat> language, and let me just get to the actual. I don't, I don't think we touched this provision back when there was the big sign code overhaul. We didn't? Not this particular section, okay. I don't think. This is kind of a remnant from the past. Okay. Um, yeah. It's been, yeah, it's been carried over and it came to our attention because we had someone request to use this criteria and I think the city's attorney's office thought, you know, one is just a reference. Why is this here? And the other may or may not be allowed <laughs> essentially. And so that's where. Uh, so if there's a church bazaar, um, can they post signs at City Park? Because I thought that was what that sign there are was. other provisions that address that. This is more about like monument signs for permanent installation. Oh, got it. I see what you're saying. Yeah, there, there's temporary signs that are allowed, and I there's see what you're saying. there's other processes. But these were, yeah, this is these are special uh, examples, not necessarily your common things that you might see. Right. Thank, okay. Thank you. That was, it kind of ties back into the conversation we we're having earlier about private use of public property. Yes. Got it. To say the city manager could allow a permanent use of public property without going through the process to convey that interest struck me as problematic. Um, but yeah, there are other provisions about signs during parades and you know mm -hmm. things like that. Time and date and expiration. Right, yeah. right. Okay. All of that will still remain. Um, so we're removing the, um, so the city manager won't be able to do that anymore without going, okay. Right. Rainy man. Rainy man. No. Number, <laughs> number eight. You can, just, you can strike that from the front <laughs> <laughs> Number eight. Uh, definition of family. So does that, is that now going to convey throughout all of the code? That's the idea here. So even when it comes to rentals, um, you know, I hear so, you know, people have had issue with blended families or however it is that they're, but now this seems to kind of take care of all uh, protected classes and whatnots. And so rental permits would be a little different. This would apply to references to family in the zoning code. Um, Rental permits are based on parking spaces and bedrooms, and it's a little different 
the zoning code deals with adult occupancy. That's kind of what. what but not chill. So children doesn't matter for parking. It 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 all <laughs> it all varies. This is kind of the cleaning up of the the zoning code. The housing code different was yeah it was a little different in how they approached it. Okay. Um, Fair enough. So I can't speak to all those challenges, unfortunately. But I appreciate that answer. Um, and so ten, really, you're talking about Airbnbs. Correct. Okay. I just wanted to make that clarification. That's all my questions. It wasn't so bad. Any additional questions Can for staff? Us? I have a B and B question. Why? Why isn't that an antiquated term? I mean, when, if you look for short-term rentals in Iowa City, they're not giving you breakfast anymore. I mean, <laughs> I it's bed like breakfast. It's well, maybe they should. Maybe there are bed and breakfasts, but I mean, I just think most of them say, you know, here's the basement of my house that I'm renting out, and it has a kitchenette with it, and you come and do what you want, and we're not giving you breakfast. Um, so bed and breakfast is probably an antiquated term, but it, there's no requirement for breakfast in our code. This is just the <laughs> definition that we've been using for an accessory short-term rental, essentially. And it used to restrict it to 14 days, uh, but now that's that's not compliant with state law. So we've it's essentially a short-term rental. We just didn't change the name because it's already in the zoning code. It just seems like you're going to all this work. You may as well call it a short-term rental, but I, I'm, I can live with it. But... It's like bed and breakfast. I mean, you know. Let's keep it alive, Susan. Let's keep it alive. Well, I think it's a different experience. I mean, a bed and breakfast is a different experience than a short-term rental where you go and the key's under the mat and you go in and you never see anybody. Yeah. And you, maybe you don't want to see anybody. It's fine. Mm -hmm. Don't want breakfast. All right. <laughs> Any additional questions for staff? Anyway. <laughs> Seeing none, thank you, Kirk. Uh, thank we'll, you. <laughs> we'll open the public hearing on this agenda item for REZ 22-0004. Seeing no public present, we'll close the public hearing. Is there a motion? So moved. Minus. Is that, uh, Commissioner approve. Townsend, is that a motion to, to approve, approve yes. but to defer item two in the agenda, which uh, clarify historic preservation exception applicability is the title to All defer that one up. item? Second. Motion Townsend, second by Martin. Discussion? I only have one discussion item, only as a, it, it, I, I have a feeling it won't be particularly popular, but um, the, uh, the item on, and I'm going to vote yes for this, but on item number one, add pedestrian circulation requirements. I am 100% in favor of making everybody put in sidewalks. So. Yes, I'm oh. with you. <laughs> yes. No, so that, yes. May, that may be, give me food off the dais, but I just think uh, we've got to get people out of walking on the streets. I mean. People walk on the streets when there is a sidewalk. Exactly. I but. swear to God. <laughs> anyway. More grass. <clears throat> I just okay. wanted to give my editorial comment Especially for, on for Kimball staff Road on that where one. there's lots of traffic. They're in the streets. <laughs> Any other discussion? I just wanted to, in relation to number nine, I just wanted to, to note that um, Friday is the 150th anniversary of Arbor Day, so hopefully y'all can go out and plant a tree. Yay! A large one hey, or a small one? A large one or a small one. <laughs> <laughs> the, the size of your choice. Right. The size of your choice. <laughs> Thank you very much. Any other discussion on this item? I just think it's good they're cleaning, starting to clean this stuff up, because some of this yes. Yeah, so I would agree. This is a real nice job of finding some things that just needed yep. tidied. So good job and a lot of work there. All right. So we got a motion by Townsend, second by Martin. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Hearing no nays, the motion passes unanimously. Item number seven, consideration of meeting minutes for March 2, 2022. <coughs> Are there any major additions or corrections to those minutes as listed in the agenda? Move approval. Motion by Craig. Is there a second? Second. Second by Martin. Discussion? Hearing no discussion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Hearing no nays, motion passes unanimously. Item number eight, planning and zoning information. Ann or Kirk? Just or Sarah. Want to be fair? <laughs> 
One item, the the right of way vacation at eight twenty nine Kirkwood has finally I, passed. The I sign should be it. the sign. I missed sign it. down. Oh my gosh! I think the sign is down. So no, it's not. No more it's not. Nope. I was going to say it wasn't last week. Nope. Well, well it, wasn't it, it was taken to down down today. Oh, you want me to stop it? Stop and pick it up if that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll be honest. I had not seen the. I had not paid attention to the agenda last time because I wasn't going to be here, and I'm so disappointed I missed that. <laughs> <laughs> Any additional PNZ information? I would like to note that uh, we are rescinding Mr. Sign's gold star for perfect attendance. <laughs> so officially a scoff law now, and I'd like to recognize Commissioner Townsend for her Yay. continued perfect attendance. So now she's going to go up to a platinum star be, rather yes. than a gold star. Be careful, Billy. I need to have an accident happen next month. <laughs> oh, <maybe. yeah>. oh. <laughs> All right. Is there a motion for adjournment? So, so moved. Second. Motion by Townsend, second by Signs. Discussion? Hearing no discussion. All those in favor signify saying aye. 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 Motion passed unanimously. We're adjourned. Thank you, everybody.